So just getting started, I'm gonna, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to step back and actually make the case for social and emotional variables because I don't think we've done that yet this morning. We've been sort of talking about it as a given that these are important and I gather from the poll at the beginning that everybody in here believes they're important. Um, but I want to just sort of set the context for why I think they're important and make the case a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to tell you two stories, one about the Collaborative for Building After School Systems that's kind of tackled this subject and had a measure um, at a large scale some of these indicator, non-academic indicators, and then share a little bit about the Providence After School Alliance and kind of our story from the startup in 2004 to where we are now and how we've been kind of grappling with this concept over, over the years. And then I'll end with a couple of resources that might be useful for this group. Um, so why do social and emotional indicators matter? Um, this seems a little basic here. They matter because they do. But everybody's always saying they matter because they connect to academics. They matter because of this. They matter because of what they connect to. And I want to make the case that they matter um, because they're valuable. Um, we want our youth that are participating in after school programs to be more caring, confident, empathetic individuals. Um, they're going to be better corporate CEOs or teachers or lawyers or politicians or whatever they end up being if they have some of these skills, um, regardless of what it means for their job performance or their, you know, the way they, their in, how they do in college or their academic performance. I think it's really important because it is. Um, so the CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning um, put together a framework and, and we've heard um, from Chris about their framework and uh, Carrie mentioned what Sprockets is talking about. So there's lots of different ways of talking about these indicators, um, but I'm going to just talk about these five um, as, as sort of a framework for what social and emotional learning means and what social and emotional indicators are. Um, so starting with self-management, and that's kind of that ability to calm yourself down when you're upset and, and um, manage your emotions, uh, self-awareness being your, the young person's ability to kind of manage and recognize their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, responsible decision-making kind of speaks for itself, but that's a sort of ethical decision-making concept. Um, relationship skills, the ability to solve problems and deal with a kind of conflict resolution, and finally social awareness. Um, and that's the sort of ability to recognize what's going on with other people around you. Um, but I'd add two more. Um, the first is this concept of grit has come up, tenacity, whatever you want to call it. I think that's a, another one that I would add to the CASEL framework. Um, that's around persistence and the ability to kind of set a goal, accomplish something, stay focused, and, and really finish what you're doing. Um, and, and the Rakes Foundation's been talking about that and some other um, people around the country. Um, and then curiosity is one of my own that I would add um, that I think after school is particularly well poised to, to do. Um, so I don't know if I, I'll give you a second to read this. So I came across this article about a year ago. I don't know if anyone's read it. Um, it was a new, Newsweek article called The Creativity Crisis. And um, it sort of struck, struck a chord with me when I read it, um, partly because I have a preschooler that nearly drives me up the wall with all her questions. And then juxtaposed with working with middle school students in Providence who, you know, I, I, that there is this kind of something that happens as kids get older where they, their curiosity may, may get dimmed. Um, and I think after school and OSC programs have kind of a unique ability to really um, stimulate that curiosity, get kids re-engaged, um, help them figure out what they're interested in. Um, you know, we had a student, a sixth grader in the after zones that her first program that she took was a filmmaking class. And she loved it so much that she kept doing it through the after zones all through middle school, um, went on to work with a film, pr film producer in Providence through high school, and now is applying to film school. And that was just because she took one after zone class in sixth grade, and we got her interested in something that she's really now passionate about and wants to do for the rest of her life. Um, and I think after school really has an opportunity to do that. So now back to the, the more practical. Um, social and emotional outcomes matter because they do connect to academic achievement and school-related indicators. Um, and Chris talked about this a bit, and I, I, I'm going to just talk a little bit about some research that the that CASEL has done kind of going back there. If you haven't been to CASEL's website, I strongly recommend you go check it out. There's a lot of great resources and information on there about social and emotional learning, social and emotional measures. Uh, but they did a particularly interesting study, which many of you may have read. Um, they did a meta-analysis uh, looking at 213 positive youth development programs, things that said they were for specifically focusing on these social and emotional indicators. Um, and they found that students who were participating in those kinds of programs after school, they did a specific kind of set of analyses around after school programs, 
had all of these um, improvements, both in academic gains and, and social and emotional gains. And one of the things that I think is the most valuable from that study is that the, they found that all these impacts on students who are in programs that were not explicitly focused on academics. So they weren't in remediation, tutoring, you know, academic programs. They were in after school programs um, that were doing, focused really on positive youth development and yet they still had academic gains. So that's a really strong case I think for the fact that focusing on some of these things um, can lead to indicators of academic success. And it makes sense, a student who feels you know, more confident in their skills is more likely to raise their hand in class and ask the teacher when they have a question instead of sort of sitting back. A student that's been working on teamwork is gonna do better in um, you know, a class project. Um, when a student has learned how to kind of manage their emotions and calm down when they're upset, they're gonna be able to get back into the schoolwork after they have a big fight with their best friend at lunch in middle school. Think about all those fights you have with your best friend in middle school, it's like every other day, right? Um, so being, being able to kind of manage your, your emotions and calm down is going to help you be more productive at school. So it makes sense, it stands to reason that this is valuable, um, but this study kind of points that out. So now I'm going to step back and tell you a little bit about um, <coughs> two approaches, as I said. Um, one that the Collaborative for Building After School Systems has taken to this issue of measuring outcomes. So CBAS <coughs> is a collection of intermediaries from eight jurisdictions around the country. Um, and they've been focusing on systems building across um, multiple cities, and Chris talked a little bit about that system building being around relationship building, connecting, bringing groups together. Um, so Boston and Providence are two of the members, but you can see up here some of the other groups that have been part of this um, initiative. And, and CBS has focused on several policy issues, um, and one of those has been this issue of measures, and how are we measuring the success of after-school programs across, across these kind of jurisdictions in the cities. Um, and so we started to talk about um, common measures of uh, out-of-school time success, and it came up, you know, what's the problem? A lot of, what, what came up was that there is not a common definition, that it was difficult to define success, particularly at the system level, um, and thinking about intermediaries and what is their role and what are they doing for cities and what, it, what does success look like across cities. So we knew that we had this common definition problem um, and we wanted to see what the, the intermediaries were doing across the cities and that evaluations across systems were pretty rare. Um, the one I'm gonna talk about in a little bit for the Providence After School Alliance is one of the first. Um, so our strategy was to try and adopt a set of measures that would speak to kind of non-academic indicators of success um, at three levels. So we, we knew that youth outcomes are really important and that's what we're all in this for, to actually have an impact on youth. But when you're talking about systems and you're talking about what's going on across cities, looking at what's happening to programs and, and changes at the program level and then also changes at the system level are also really important. So there's three levels of indicators that you can talk about. Um, and the goal was to come up with a set of measures for the field um, that we could put out there and to talk about this sort of um, importance of, of the intermediary role and to, and to be able to say at scale across a number of different systems what the impact of OST has been. Um, there. So this is the framework we came up with. What we did was we worked with Liz Reasoner at Policy Studies Associates and tried to develop a framework um, and we wanted this to be something that was fairly easy to measure. So we, we set some criteria. We wanted these indicators to be low cost, um, low burden, meaning that they would be easy to collect, low inference, meaning that we didn't need to have a lot of training in order to collect this data. Um, and so we wanted to look at things at the youth si program and system level that met those criteria. And you'll see it was, it was a little bit challenging to come up with some things. At the system level, that was a little easier when you're talking about program slots and, and sort of usage of tools and things like that. It's a, li a little bit easier to identify cross-system indicators. Um, at the program level, we're getting down to things like ratio and kinds of the breadth of activities. Um, and at the youth level, really we started with just daily program attendance. That was something that was easy to measure across all the systems. And then went into um, kind of at a sample, a subset of programs, we could look at something a little deeper, daily school attendance. Um, and we, we um, and, the, and then at the program level, a lot of programs are using the YPQA or other youth program quality assessment kinds of tools where you could look at the relationship between the kids and the adults um, and, and their opportunities for choice and that type of thing. Um, so some of the lessons from this process, um, we found that it was really hard to collect data across multiple systems. And it was interesting to see how differently 
uh, each OST system defines um, even something as basic as slots. So, you know, in Providence, a slot is an individual slot and in an individual activity. Um, in another program, maybe an elementary program, it was a one, uh, one slot in a five-day week program. So even trying to compare um, something as simple as that was challenging across systems. And um, it was also difficult to identify those youth measures that um, met our criteria and that were valued by stakeholders and yet still captured this um, social and emotional skills. So kind of what we landed on, which um, it maybe was, is, a, is not the most encouraging story, a little discouraging, but was that we still came back, we ended up coming back to some school-related indicators, um, daily school attendance and on-time grade promotion. We wanted to stay away with those, uh, stay away from the really high-end performance measures, test scores and grades, but felt like we were all working towards um, on-time grade promotion and attendance and that those would be some benchmarks that we could look at across the systems. Um, and so that was, uh, CBAS's story is potentially not a satisfactory one and that w at the end of the process we still came to this challenge of how do we identify a non-academic indicator across an entire um, you know, system or a set of systems. Um, but I think the story is a valuable one in that we, we spent a lot of time thinking about this. We, we thought about measurement across systems and we came up with some things that are potentially measurable at scale across multiple cities. Um, but I want to now jump into the story about the Providence After School Alliance and how we've been thinking about these issues over the past uh, several years. So I'll tell you a little bit about PASA just to, to get started. We've been talking a lot about intermediaries today. I don't know how many of you in the room are really comfortable with the idea of what an intermediary is or if you're still kind of wondering. Um, but we were funded in, by the Wallace Foundation in 2004 um, to do this concept of systems building. And in, in my mind, what that means is that we were bringing um, everyone in the system to the table with what they had to offer. So sort of what Chris was talking about, but we had um, each sort of entity in the city. So we have a lot of community-based organizations that were bringing great instruction. We had schools that were bringing space and buses for transportation. We had city year that was bringing human resources, human capital to, to the table. Um, we had recreation centers that were bringing their recreation facilities and parks. Um, and then PASA was trying to leverage funding. So everybody, was bringing what they had to the table and then PASA was working to make all of that work together more efficiently and effectively. Um, and so that, in my mind, is what the role of the intermediary is, to get everyone to the table and then figure out how to work more collaboratively together, not to replace anything, not to replace programming, but to sort of coordinate programming. Um, and we, we focus on three key areas. The first um, is our sort of signature initiative is the After Zone, and that's a middle school initiative. We're serving about 1,600 middle school students across the city of Providence, um, which is about 50% um, of the middle school population. To give you a sense of the scale of Providence, it's pretty small. And then um, we've moved into working with some high school youth now in an initiative we call the Hub, which is our sort of high school after school system. And all throughout, we've been focusing on quality improvement and really looking at the program level across all of our initiatives. Um, <coughs> so when PASA started out and we were thinking about this issue, okay, we're doing systems building. We know we're not gonna have youth outcomes to show right at the beginning. And, and when you're kind of building a system, that's something I would be really realistic about. Um, that you're starting with building relationships and things like that, you're not gonna necessarily have an impact on youth right at the outset. So we spent a lot of time thinking about these three different levels of, um, of outcomes, system program and youth, same way CBAS was looking at it. Um, and knew we wanted to be able to say what's happening in each of those different areas as we move through the process. So I'm gonna go into each of them in some detail about how we were thinking about them. Um, at the system level, we started with just wanting to get everybody speaking the same language, and Kyrie mentioned this about Sprockets, that we wanna get, get people using, talking about quality in the same way, talking about what the, ha the after school standards are. Um, so we, started, we adopted the Youth Program Quality Assessment as well. I know that's being used pretty widely here in Minnesota. Um, as our way of measuring the quality of programs and getting everybody talking about what a high quality after school program looks like in the same way. Um, and then we wanted to get everybody on board with tracking participation as well. So we, we um, adopted the youthservices.net participation tracking system and, um, and then had a, a bunch of partnership agreements sort of supporting this intermediary process, supporting our partnerships across the city. And so at the system level, a lot of our goals were just getting everybody on the same page, speaking the same language, and we wanted to be able to sort of demonstrate to funders, to the community, to whoever was needing to hear it, that we were kind of getting people together. So that was our first level of um, kind of reporting at the system level. Um, but then <clears throat> knowing that our mission and our vision kind of to start was 
um, increasing access to high quality programming. We knew when to also track slots and participation and make sure we were growing just how many middle school kids were coming to programming. So in, in Providence, when we started out, there were maybe three to 400 kids um, participating in any kind of after school programming. So we wanted to grow that number. And so just monitoring that was a, a big first step. So this is a little hard to see, but basically, this is just showing you the past two years, but the way we were thinking about measuring participation was just looking at how our participation compared to the total school population and making sure each year that was kind of going up, at least at the start until we sort of hit a, a saturation point. And you can see the past two years, we've actually gone down a tiny bit um, in this last year because the school closings and the school population actually declined a little bit. But um, this was a big picture, just overall, how many kids are we serving, from which schools, how often, you know, and, and, and making sure we knew that that was going up. So that's sort of a systems level look at participation. Um, and then at the program level, we were wanting to measure quality in a number of different ways. Um, looking at the, the quality of programs through the youth program quality assessment process, um, looking at t attendance in programs and um, kind of youth satisfaction and felt like this was a way that we could have three points of interaction about what a pro the quality of a program is. And again, um, everybody wants to get to the youth outcomes and wh what the youth are getting out of it. But I think what was really valuable for us was showing that we're having an impact on the quality of programs and that we're increasing kind of the capacity of the organizations in our partnership and then over time that can we know that's going to lead to improved youth outcomes but as a start when you're kind of in early stages of developing an intermediary that this was really um, an important first step so we looked at the ypqa data in a couple of different ways um, when we first started out we didn't have a lot of comparisons between um, the two different you know, program over time. So what we did was look more at our, our programs as compared to a national average or national norm. Um, the YPQA is administered by the Weikert Center for Youth Development, um, Youth Program Quality, excuse me, out in um, Michigan, and they had are using this tool nationally, so there was a lot to compare it to. So this just gives a snapshot, bosses in the blue. We wanted to make sure that this always sort of stayed looking like this, that our, the quality of our programs was, was um, sort of at or above national benchmarks. And that just gave a snapshot again. Um, but then what we were able to do over time is that we started to see more programs multiple times, um, see, you know, get, get their quality at a, at a starting point and then check it over, over the years is that um, we saw st statistically significant improvements in their quality scores um, from, you know, point A to point B. And mostly that's just to know that the, that the system stuff we had put in place, the professional development, the training, the on-site coaching, all of that's having an impact on the quality of programs. Um, and we know that the, the higher quality of the programs, the more youth are gonna get out of it. And again, so that was an early indicator of, of success. Um, there we go. And then this is really small. This is a snapshot from our data system, um, but something that we were just always monitoring kind of on a bi-weekly basis in the after zones is how students are doing in terms of their participation and how programs so the middle column there is the percent of um, slots that are filled and then the column at the end is the average daily attendance and so whenever any of those dip below 60 percent we'd want to intervene and talk to the providers about what's going on and why are you you know why might kids stop be not coming to your programs anymore and so collectively taking uh, those two we could we could look at their quality scores and their participation rates and begin to get a story about what was going on um, and then finally, at the end of each session, we'd ask students um, what they were getting out of the programs. And one, we'd ask them to rate their programs on and kind of how, how much they enjoyed the program. And again, it's just uh, three points of data. The quality scores, the participation, and their student ratings would tell us something about um, how much they're enjoying the program, how good the program is, and then we could watch that over time. So those are kind of the program level um, indicators that we were always looking at. All right, so finally getting to the youth level. So, um, Again, in the early days, we were um, trying to think about how to talk about youth outcomes when we didn't have a whole lot, when we were still really new in this process. Um, and we knew there was a lot of research about the importance of intensity and importance of students participating three or more days a week and throughout the year. And so we did a lot of work on kind of analyzing our participation. Um, and one of the stories about this that I always like to tell is um, our executive director, Hillary Sammons, if any of you have ever met her, you won't be surprised by this story. But we, when she was talking to the Wallace Foundation when we first got the grant, and was, they were talking about, you know, how are you going to improve test scores, and what's the grades, and what are your outcomes, and really getting into all of that and getting excited about our impact. 
And Hillary said, you know what, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And when I come back, if you still want me to improve test scores and grades on a systems building initiative where we're trying to get people talking, get people on the same page, then um, you need to find a new director. And she's still our director, so they obviously um, did not, did not uh, they, they changed their thinking a little and realized that this is incremental. You need to start thinking about participation. You need to start with access. You need to start with getting kids in the door. Um, and a lot of individual programs are doing all this stuff really well. I mean, all of you in the room who are program people are saying, well, you know, we're already doing this. We have kids in the door. We're doing great programming. But when you're thinking about the systems perspective and looking at a, a student's participation across multiple days of programming, across multiple types of programming, um, early on it was really about getting increasing access, improving the slots, getting more kids involved, um, and then some of those program and system level indicators that I was talking about. <clears throat> so we spent a lot of time looking at participation in a lot of different ways. Um, but that didn't carry us forever, obviously. So the Wallace Foundation funded a, um, a longitudinal study. Um, they contracted with pu public-private ventures to do this study for us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the findings from that. Um, and it's, it was actually a two-part study. There's an implementation study that came out about a year a year ago, but um, more recently, about a month ago, the impact study came out. And I'll tell you a little bit about the findings. Some of you may have seen it. Um, but it was a quasi-experimental design, which meant that it, they were really looking at a cohort of participants and non-participants over two years and trying to look at what the impact of this after zone um, was having on these middle school kids. Um, and. So I'm going to start with the school-related indicators. What we had, we, the, the study was designed to look at school-related indicators and social and emotional indicators, and we were really um, pushing them to focus a lot on the social and emotional because we felt like that's where we were going to have the most impact. Um, and it turns out we were wrong, which was sort of surprising. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit, I'll, I'll explain that in a little, a little more detail. So um, what they found with when they compared all participants to non-participants, regardless of how much they came, um, was that we, Participants seem to have about 25% fewer uh, absences from school than the non-participants. So that's, you know, it's something we can champion to the school district and was good news. Um, it sort of makes sense because you have to come to school to go to the after zone. So if they're really excited about what they're doing after school, they're going to come to school in order to get to it. Um, and then hopefully once they're in school more often, the schools can then do what they do and, and, and have an impact on academics. Um, the second finding around math grades was a little, you know, we sort of, we don't want to put too much stock in that, but um, there was this a finding that students were improving their math grades, so that was good news. Um, and then when they looked a little deeper and dug into participation, again, that participation finding was really important, um, that students who were attending 32 days or more had a lot, a range of other academic impacts. And um, we were kind of intrigued by that concept, and when we started looking, we had been doing all this participation um, analysis over the years, so we were able to say, okay, how many of our kids are actually coming 32 days or more? How many are, you know, is this, are we impacting a lot of our students in this way or a small number? And found that um, it was about a third of our participants were coming that often, so we knew we needed to do better. And having done all this sort of intense participation analysis from the beginning helped us to then make use of these findings that we had now, so that was really valuable. Um, so again, I can't say enough about kind of focusing on participation. It seems basic, but it was really valuable for us. Um, so then getting into the social and emotional indicators, so they were looking at um, kind of the impact on some of these social and emotional variables, and what was really discouraging, and I hate to say this in this group, but you'll read it in the study if you look at it, <laughs> is that when they looked at participants and non-participants, they didn't have a lot of findings. Um, there were some findings after a year um, that students felt a little more connected to school and were a little, had a, a little bit better behavior, but that, that kind of dissipated after the second year of participation. Um, so then they dug a little deeper and, and looked at students who were reporting a um, strong sense of engagement, and they defined engagement, um, public-private ventures did, by these three things, a feeling a sense of belonging in the after zone, um, having a sense of adult support, um, and, and then they thought the after zones were fun. So when they looked at students who reported high engagement, there was a whole bunch of social and emotional findings. Um, they thought more about their future, better social skills, more positive behavior, et cetera. And so I think um, a couple of important things from this. One is that um, the, so the, the power of this, the um, 
school-related indicators to me is, again, what I said about the Castle study earlier. The after zones did not explicitly focus on academics, and it didn't matter whether kids were in sports four days a week or something that was a little more academically oriented. They had those school-related findings regardless. Um, so that, again, speaks to the power of uh, these programs that are, are kind of engaging um, youth in a variety of things, connecting some things they're interested in. Um, you know, maybe running around and, and doing sports and getting some physical activity is what they really need to kind of connect them back and get them focused on their schoolwork, whatever it is. Um, we found, you know, so that was one large lesson from the study that was really important to me. And then this finding about engagement, I think, is really critical because it tells, tells me we need to focus more on um, some of those quality indicators that I mentioned earlier that again, at the beginning seemed like it's not very sexy, it's not very exciting to be talking about program quality and participation and systems, tools, and things um, when you're, s you're getting started. But now that we have these findings, they can say, okay, the programs that are engaging students the most are probably going to be those ones that have the high quality scores, that have kids with high average daily attendance, that are really, um, you know, coming to the programs in high levels, and, and, and that we want to focus on that because that's telling us something about what works. Um, and particularly those programs where they grew, where the, particip the participation improved or the quality scores grew, what was going on in those programs that we need to go back and find out what did the instructors do differently, what kinds of professional development did they participate in that we should know about, so we can really continue to push on that um, in order to increase levels of engagement so that the student, more of students will be engaged and therefore have some of these social emotional impacts. Um, so where is PASA going now? I've already gotten into this a little bit, but that's, um, that's where we're going now. We want to focus on a couple of these findings from this study. One, we need to get kids coming more often. So if only a third of our kids are coming 32 days or more, we need to, get, we need to improve that. So targeted recruitment, you know, trying to get more and more students coming on a regular basis. And we want to improve those levels of engagement, um, again, through <coughs> focusing on the professional development, staff, staff training and staff development. Um, continuing to measure the quality. And I think getting back to my point about curiosity at the beginning, I think really stimulating kids' curiosity, getting them re-engaged and, and learning and what they're doing is going to have that impact on getting them more engaged. If they feel like they're really finding out what they're interested in doing something really powerful, they're going to be more engaged. They're going to they're gonna say the after zones are fun. They're going to feel like they have some um, adult support. Um, and so in addition, we want to continue thinking about this issue of measurement. Um, the PPV study used a pre and post youth survey, and I'm not convinced that's necessarily the best way to um, measure a student's social and emotional well-being, particularly at the middle school level. I think some of these approaches that are um, the SEO uses kind of a retroactive um, student assessment where they think about, they think back, what did this program impact for me? Um, what do I know more now than I did previously? Those kind of measures, I think, are are going to be more valuable than this pre and post where students are saying what they feel at the beginning of a program and at the end of a program. Um, and then there are other pro um, approaches that have um, teachers reporting on students and the impact on students and sort of saying what, what difference or change they've seen in students. And I think those kind of surveys are also going to be more valuable than just using the traditional pre-post um, assessment. So we're thinking a lot at PASA about measurement now going forward. How do we want to measure some of these things? Um, how do we want to get at that engagement question? Because if it's that important, then we need to be measuring it all the time, not once every three years when we have one of these big studies. Um, so using some of these measures of engagement, I think, is really important. So that's what we're thinking about now. Um, I wanted to share with you just a new compendium um, that's come out. Literally, this slide doesn't have the URL, but I, I put it on my notes because I um, it's, it was published on Tuesday. But the Forum for Youth Investment has been doing some work on and uh, building this compendium of social and emotional indicators. Um, they looked at eight tools, so the SEO that Chris mentioned is one of them, and they looked at seven others, um, California Healthy Kids Survey, the Developmental Assets Profile, and a few others. Um, and they kind of compared them across, they used four different areas. I talked about five areas of social and emotional learning earlier. Chris mentioned some. There's a, the Sprockets initiative has one, but these are the four that they talked about, communication, relationships and collaboration, um, critical thinking and decision making, and, and initiative and self-direction. And you can see all the different things we've been talking about today are, are in there somewhere. Um, but they looked at tools that measure these things um, and looked, compared them against things like accessibility, their technical properties in terms of validity, reliability, um, how much they cost, how they're used, all that stuff. So it's a really neat compendium. It has a lot of information in it. Um, we can 
I don't post the network the URL somewhere or you can also just go to the Forum Freeze Investments website. It's posted on there now as of I believe Tuesday. Um, but it might be really useful for those of you who are thinking about that and looking for new measures. Um, so I would just point that out. It's called from soft skills to hard data. And they worked with um, uh, who did they work with? Um, David Dubois from the University of Illinois at Chicago. So um, they kind of had a, a researcher helping them think about this and look at the technical properties. Um, <coughs> and then finally, um, just uh, some resources that might be useful for you. Um, I don't know if this PowerPoint is somewhere that you can get to these easily without having to take all your notes down, but I just wanted to give you the links to the PPV study if you haven't seen it on the after zones. Um, as I said before, I highly recommend that you go to the CASEL website and um, you can get the, that um, Joe Durlach and Roger Weisberg's study. You can download it from their website. And they also have a link to a whole bunch of tools that they recommend and think are really good in terms of measuring social and emotional indicators. So um, it's, a, it's a really good resource if you poke around. Um, we, the, there was an article written up about the CBAS work that I mentioned, the measures work that goes into more detail. So if you're interested in hearing more about that or reading more about that, you can go to the Speaking in One Voice um, report. And then the Rakes Foundation also did a compendium of kind of social and emotional measures, um, for particularly for middle school youth, but it's that's the URL for that. So it's another compendium of these tools. But again, if you're looking for tools, trying to figure out how to measure this stuff, there's a few different good resources out there. 